This video is part of a study series titled Biblical Salvation Settled Once and for All. Please see the playlist link in the video description. Hello and welcome back. So in this video of the series we'll be looking at John chapter 11. Um, this will probably be a shorter study than some of the chapters I've covered in John just because John 11 is a very very different from uh, previous chapters in the study. So uh, we'll be looking more closely at Jesus' personal relationships. Um, the dialogue is more pleasant because Jesus is speaking with faithful believers who think very highly of him in this chapter rather than unsaved Jews who rejected him. So uh, they'll be a bit more more positive in this chapter, but there's, there's not as much that we need to unpack. Although that being said, uh, we'll, we'll tap into more details about the resurrection. So uh, I've not included the first seven verses just because for, for salvation doctrine, there's nothing that we really need to get from those. So starting at verse eight. So his disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone you, and do you go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not, because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go, that I may awake him out of his sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go into him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. So, uh, initially when, uh, when, when Jesus answers them, his response seems rather strange, given the question that the disciples actually asked him. So, Jesus doesn't seem to address the answer directly rather he he turns it into this this miniature parable here so towards the remainder of the chapter we'll, we'll explain why jesus says this but what but what's going on here is that, that jesus is withholding uh from preventing lazarus from dying so jesus could have obviously stopped lazarus from dying but jesus willfully allows lazarus to die in this story so that he can display greater work in in resurrecting him for the for the purpose that people and, and especially the disciples and martha and so on will will believe in him as he as he suggests in verse 15 so you know it's to the intent that that you may believe that that's the goal of what jesus is doing here so uh here we we see jesus using sleep as a euphemism for uh, being dead, although albeit soon to be reawakened, and the Bible does this elsewhere. So, uh, for example, let's take a look at First Thessalonians four. So, uh, in First Thessalonians four, Paul uses similar language. He he talks about the um, dead in Christ, as you can see on the screen there in verses thirteen to eighteen, describing them as being asleep. Quote unquote. Now, you you can argue that the Bible uses this metaphor for for two reasons, because rather like sleep those who are dead in christ are, they're not in a permanent state of death they will awaken from their sleep so just like lazarus wakes uh, from from this in john uh, chapter 11 so uh, also during their sleep they they are in a state of rest um you know just like when you go to sleep you're you're resting and, and we see glimpses of this rest in uh, Luke 16 as well so let's take a brief look at Luke 16 so uh, I'm not going to read it out just because it's not part of, of John 11 but uh, you've got these verses here 19 to 26 and we see uh, two men here so we see one is Lazarus but it's not the same Lazarus from John chapter 11 it's just very uh, uncoincidentally also happens to be called Lazarus uh, who made it into heaven uh, he's in Abraham's bosom that's that's in heaven and this is con contrasted with the rich man who who lifted his up his eyes in hell okay so this lazarus in in this story uh made it to heaven and he was being comforted so he's he's resting in abraham's bosom this is uh this is rest what's going on here essentially so he, he was in a place of, of comfort as this uh this goes on to say so um like abraham said you know uh, lazarus received evil things but but he he is comforted now okay um and uh, you know the disciples said in uh, in verse 12 of john 11 lord if he sleeps he shall do well even though perhaps they they misunderstood the application of what exactly jesus is talking about 
so going back to John 11 then um so when when Thomas said um let us go also that we may die with him uh, it's not entirely clear why Thomas said this so you know perhaps he misunderstood why Jesus was going to take them to Lazarus or, or exactly what Jesus meant by this uh, and, and likewise we don't know this but it's possible that maybe Thomas was trying to look like he knew what Jesus was talking about in, in front of the other disciples or they were all trying to look like they knew what Jesus meant you know when when they didn't really know what he meant we, we've all been you know guilty of that at some point in our lives uh, you know we don't want to be seen like we don't know what's going on um moving on then into the next verses so verse 17 then uh, then when jesus came he found that he had lain in the grave four days already now bethany was near unto jerusalem about 15 furlongs off and many of the jews came to martha and mary to comfort them concerning their brother then martha as soon as she heard that jesus was coming went and met him but mary sat still in the house then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, will give it you. Jesus said unto her, Your brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said unto him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So here we notice uh, Martha believes the resurrection, as, as we see there in verse 24. Um, this is being perhaps being before being aware that Christ must rise again. Um, as we see from elsewhere in the Bible, there was conflict between the Pharisees and the Sa Sadducees about uh, this particular issue. Um, now, although Lazarus's death and sleep was unremarkable in of itself um and his resurrection was not the glorified resurrection that we look forward to the happenings that are going on here do give us a pattern as to what our waiting for the resurrection looks like okay so uh, the lazarus in luke 16 and his rich man counterpart experienced consciousness pretty much immediately after their earthly death at least if you if you take a, a more literal view of luke 16 whereas the lazarus in john 11 and paul's writings in 1 thessalonians 4 suggest that there is a sleep okay before the the resurrection or, or the rising now we will look at a little bit about the soul sleep doctrine that's out there i'll, I'll leave that towards the end i won't address it now but the, this issue of sleep it, it would require rather a complex explanation and, and perhaps a bit of a deep study that would digress a bit too far from john 11 so i'm not really going to study it in great detail here but but here's a summary for you so from our earthly perspective those who have died physically are asleep as far as we can perceive uh, the resurrection is a, is a bodily rising again uh, in the future from now on the earth so that the spirits of the departed that they're they're resting in heaven uh, you know if, if they are saved at least so while they're only dead in earthly terms that they're not truly dead because even before the resurrection or even before the the death of the flesh one's eternal life has already begun the moment a person gets saved so you you get saved you believe on the lord jesus christ your flesh is still dying but but you have been saved your eternal life begins now and this is consistent with what jesus said in verse 26 he that believes in me shall never die well it, it obviously isn't referring to flesh there okay otherwise you'd have that that would be a crazy statement essentially uh, and we also see we, we see then why we need to distinguish between the flesh and the spirit although a bit like john 3 with the issue of being born again it's not something that john's gospel really delves into a lot of detail we tend to get more about this from uh, romans and, and galatians but um jesus said believers shall never die and yet we are, we are all decaying in in this flesh so so we must understand that our flesh will die but but we ourselves and our born again spirit um will not we, you know again we can't go into that too deeply here because there's not enough information from john's gospel on the subject but but fundamentally that's what we must understand our flesh dies our born again spirit is what is passed on uh, onto life and, and shall never die so you know a lot of people with a work salvation they point to all these passages about you know living in the flesh and, and so on and so forth but but the flesh is dead that's what you've got to understand about that uh, now 
what exactly when when Jesus says I am the resurrection, it's not just I give resurrection, but but I am the resurrection and I am the life. Um, what exactly does that mean? Well, perhaps to you that's a bit of a daft question. It seems rather obvious, but we'll, we'll explain it anyway. So. Um, after all, obviously, Lazarus is going to be resurrected. Uh, we look forward to a, a future resurrection. So, so what does Jesus mean by saying he is the resurrection? Well, uh, the answer lies in understanding how regeneration uh, works. So um, you take these passages like John 1.14, uh, John 3.16, Acts 13.33. Um, it refers to Jesus as the only uh, begotten and, and the father has has begotten the son there so uh previously in john's gospel we, we haven't seen we, we we have seen it explained sorry that, that jesus is the only begotten um the word begotten normally means brought into existence like a parent begats a child but but the bible also teaches that jesus is eternal so he's not begotten in this same manner obviously he is from everlasting to everlasting but he is he is god manifest in the flesh as we see in first timothy three fifteen. so in this manner this is the manner in which he's begotten he he's made you know into the world in in, in the manner of flesh and of course you know after his death uh, he was raised to life uh, again in the flesh okay so, from the eternal perspective, everything that he accomplished in those three days, talking about Jesus, was already foreordained before all, all the foundation of the world. So, it, in heavenly realms, it already happened, but from our earthly perspective, it's manifest in these particular times. So, Acts thirteen thirty three and also one John, uh, sorry, John one fourteen, explain that while it is Jesus who is the only begotten one, and and it is the Father that begat him in these contexts and so that's why jesus is described as his only begotten son okay but then when you look at these verses here so like first corinthians 4 15 1 peter 3 3 uh, 1 john 5 1 it refers actually to us as believers as being uh, begotten as begotten of him or begotten by the resurrection of christ or begotten through the gospel so you know we are begotten as well so if, if we're begotten how can jesus be the only begotten son um well, well this is kind of explained in these verses so so notice that in 1 john 5 he that is born of god begotten not only loves he that begat god uh, but also loves him you know anybody whoever he is that is begotten of him so jesus is begotten of the father but also the brethren okay so on under on, but ultimately what happens is so while christ is begotten of the father uh, in the world because christ is from everlasting we are begotten of christ in eternity because we are not from everlasting but we are passed on to everlasting life so uh, you know because christ as christ defeated death demonstrated by his resurrection so shall we by our faith in him and, and what he accomplished okay so fundamentally that that's what what he means there to, to the i am the resurrection he says now look at this here look at the um simplicity of martha's response to jesus now now bearing in mind this is about eternal life here whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die so you know this this is an eternal life statement here that jesus is making and Martha's response uh, response is very simple, oh. and I I like the fact that her response is simple. It's very direct. It's not overly emotional or or sensationalized. Now you might be wondering, so what? You know what what point am I trying to make by by pointing that out? Well, we we've seen previously in this study that that Jesus, you know, in our series we've looked at how Jesus defines salvation as an entrance or it's an instantaneous event it's not some uh, lifelong drawn out journey that, that may or may not come to fruition so just in case you've uh, forgotten those verses here are some reminders so like in john uh, 10 9 he describes it as i am the door and if any man enter in so it's simply walking through an entrance uh, you've got john 5 24 where it says is passed from death unto life it's not is passing or will pass or may pass it is passed it's already happened um you've got uh verses like john 3 3 uh, where it says uh born again now people i've heard so many people take born again and make that this 
lifelong journey. But when you were born as a baby, it, it was a one-time event. Okay, it doesn't make sense to take that statement and make that a lifelong journey. Born is, is something that happened to you once. So likewise, being born in the spirit, birth, it happened once. Okay. Uh, now, a very misabused uh, passage is Matthew seven thirteen and 14, where they talk about walking down this narrow way that you know leads on to life and you could stray from the path and this that and the other but the thing is though as we've looked at before when we've looked at this jesus said few there be that find it he didn't say few there be that make it to the end or few there be that can fight through all the snakes thorns and thistles it's few there be that find it because once you've found the gate and you've found the way well you found it simple as that uh, you have john four thirteen and 14 where jesus describes it as a a uh, drink of, of water so you know you take a drink and you shall never thirst so you know drink water it's something that's very brief it's not a lifelong thing to drink one glass of water uh you've got john six this is perhaps a less clear example but you know jesus being the bread of life uh, and you know you shall never hunger so uh, you know bread again you have a piece of bread it doesn't take your whole life to eat that piece of bread that's one piece of bread and uh you come to Jesus, you shall never hunger and never thirst. So the, these are kind of verses that, you know, make it look fairly instantaneous, pretty much um, immediate. Now, people who proclaim a works-based salvation, and they define uh, salvation as like a path, they, they often sensationalise what happens when somebody ought to believe the gospel. So, so you hear them say, you know, statements like this, like, if you have truly accepted the gospel, you will pour out in tears and fall on your knees as you recognise the gravity of all of your sins. And, uh, you know, they, they always point to that. It's not enough to believe. The devils also believe and tremble. So you better, you know, be getting down to work. And you can't just believe stuff about Christ. You have to prove it with all of these works of obedience. And repentance means that you completely transform your life abandoning your old ways and surrendering your life to Jesus. You know, it's always dramatic and sensationalised and drawn out. You know, this is all the kind of stuff that they say. You know, it's not just enough to believe. We've got all this dramatic emotion and, you know, stuff that's got to be happening. But you just go back to a response like this. Martha's response is powerful just because of how simple and unsensational is it's not like lord i get on my knees and i'm so sorry for everything that i've done and i will completely turn my life around from here it's just you live you believe in me you shall never die do you believe this i believe that you are the christ the son of god which should come into the world very very simple brief response we don't need all of these tears and life transformation and you know turning our life around just a very very simple statement to a very very simple commandment you know, very, very simple. And, and that's why I, I love that. You know, it's just so straightforward. Now, you know, yes, there were other things about Martha that show she was, you know, she loved Jesus very dearly. Yes and amen. But with the topic of eternal life, we have a simple statement. OK, this, this doesn't need to be overly emotional or drawn out. And, and you can accept that when you actually believe that salvation is an entrance. OK, it's much harder to justify that when it becomes this lifelong journey. Um. So moving on then, so uh, later in the story, Mary uh, wept over Lazarus um, and Jews came to comfort her while she was weeping. And then verse 35, one of those very, very short but profound verses in the Bible, Jesus wept. Um, and then verse 36, then the Jews said, behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? So they're, they're doubting Jesus there, it seems. Uh, Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, comes to the grave. It was a cave, and the stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take you away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Did I not say unto you that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I knew that you hear me always, but because of the people which stand by, uh, I said it, uh, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth and bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, Loose him and let him go. So uh, now we essentially see why Jesus, earlier in the chapter, withheld from uh, saving Lazarus from being dead in the first place. You know, this was all planned that the, the glory of God should uh, be displayed there. You know, not to just 
show off or give a show, but you know, so that the people observing would would believe in him. That that was the goal. It's it's all to believe on Christ because you know anybody can just come along and say, "Hey, look at me, I'm Jesus, I'm the one." Well, Jesus actually proved it with his works, and we, we've seen that in previous chapters that we looked at, like uh, the previous chapter, John chapter ten. Uh, now earlier in the chapter, Martha's belief was looking rather more confident but it's looking a little bit less confident now. But it's important to consider that just because somebody has a weak faith or a limited understanding, they are still saved if they believe the gospel. Okay, so, you know, we'll, we'll see this played out more in John 14 to 16, where, where Jesus needs to edify the faith of the disciples. Because while the disciples are believers and they trust Christ, apart from Judas, obviously, that there are some things in John 14 and 15 that they're not quite grasping. And Jesus still says to, you know, do you not believe these things? Do you not understand these things already? So, you know, he, he needs to build them up in those chapters. And that's something that we'll explore uh, very soon in this series when we get to those chapters. Now, um, following on then, so from verse 45, then many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did and believed on him. Uh, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. So the Jews were obviously, as they very often were, very polarised. You've got those who saw the miracles and believed in him. And then there's those who saw the miracles and they went to the Pharisees to try and get Jesus in, in some kind of trouble. You know, instead of just quietly going home and forgetting about it, you know, they, they seem to go all the way the opposite way. So uh, what happens then later in this story, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they counsel together. Um, you know, what what do we do? This man does does many miracles. And if we leave him alone, all men will believe on him and the Romans shall come and take away our place and nation. Um, and then uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, uh, he said to these chief priests and Pharisees, you know nothing at all. Uh, didn't, you don't consider what is expedient for us that one man should die for the people so that the whole nation perishes not. And this he didn't speak of himself, but the high priest of that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but that she should gather the, ch the children of God that were scattered abroad in, into one. And then from that day they took counsel together to, to put him to death, and then the remaining re re sorry remaining verses are just the Pharisees and the chief priests seeking to kill Jesus. So uh, it, the rest of the story here, it, it seems almost kind of... Um, strange really that the pharisees and chief priests they actually acknowledged jesus's ability to do miracles they they didn't accuse him of faking it they actually acknowledged that he could do them and a very similar thing happened when they uh, blasphemed the holy ghost the, the unforgivable sin they attributed something that the holy ghost did to satan but they couldn't refute the actual miracle though uh, but you know that's that's neither here nor there though just a side comment so um Syaphas, Syaphas, sorry i can't pronounce that his prophesying is is interesting here because he knew that jesus had to die for the nation quote unquote uh, but his saying here would indicate that he thought this referred to the physical nation of israel rather than the spiritual uh, nation of actual believers so it seems as if he's prophesying half right half wrong there uh, perhaps you might disagree with the way i'm reading there but that, that's fine but you know in any case they they desire to have jesus to be put to death but it but it wasn't for for righteous motives and it just seems bizarre to us that, that you would see all those miracles and yet they they still want to have jesus put to death essentially um but but their rejection of jesus really it reflects a pattern that we've seen um elsewhere in the bible that that people know of god but glorify him not as god so for example you have the reprobate mind in romans 1 and even the people professing to be god's own people are themselves actually some of the most difficult people to reach with the gospel or, or the truth and uh, I, I found when out evangelizing soul winning that it, you know it's amazed it amazed me how many christian are actually very difficult to deal with christians are some of the most difficult people to deal with because an atheist might just politely say no thanks or you know they might even stick a finger up at you but they just won't talk to you necessarily christians they're just a really funny bunch to deal with and very difficult because you would expect that they actually want to listen it's amazing how many christians when you ask them do you know for sure you would go to heaven oh, i hope so not really quite sure well can we show you Oh, I need to feed the baby. You know, it's amazing how many of them need to feed the baby when they're not quite sure how they'd make it to heaven. It's, it never stops, um, you know, bemusing me, to be honest. So, um, 
One last point, I know this has been very brief, uh, this has been quite a short study video because there's not a lot to pluck out from this chapter, so we're coming towards the end really, but one last point to be considered is just to revisit Lazarus's sleep period when his, his body was clinically dead. Now you, you might be wondering during that time, um, was Lazarus conscious at all during this period? Um, did he have an out-of-body experience or did he have a a vision of, of heaven or hell. Uh, people will wonder that about Lazarus. And it, it's it's a question worth asking because um, there are many testimonies out there of people who have claimed to have a profound uh, out-of-body experience during temporary periods where they were clinically dead, but they, they came back to life again. Uh, many of them experienced uh, visions of heaven or hell or some sort of uh, light versus darkness themed kind of a vision you, you can get quite a few of those on youtube if you're interested in those and then um there's various sects like the jehovah's witnesses the seventh day adventists the christ delphians they they believe in a soul sleep doctrine where a person is not conscious uh, while waiting for their resurrection so when you point to them a passage like luke 16 they would dismiss it as just being a parable or only symbolic rather than a proof of conscious awareness after death so the, the problem is that this is a matter where the bible just doesn't entertain our curiosity uh, it doesn't explain it, it does explain obviously that lazarus was raised from the dead uh, he sat at a meal with jesus and the jews wanted to inquire of him some for better some for worse and that that's at the beginning of chapter 12 uh, but we we have absolutely no dialogue from Lazarus in John 11 or 12. We, we don't have any dialogue, um, any quotes from Lazarus describing his experience. So, so the Bible's just silent on the matter. We, we don't know what his personal experience was. Now, um, Paul does talk very briefly about uh, knowing a man in a manner that he, he may, have, may have been an out-of-body experience. That's in 2 Corinthians 12. But Paul wasn't fully sure about that. Now, this was a nameless person. Paul could have even been talking about himself. It, it might even be possible that he even met Lazarus, but chose not to reveal his identity for whatever reason. Or it was simply nobody else, and it's it's not even relevant to this matter at all. Um, now, there are testimonies out there of um, out-of-body experiences and visions of heaven and hell. Um, a lot of those are well known on YouTube. You, you've probably seen some of them. They are interesting to listen to, um, but they ought to be treated with the utmost caution. I'm, I'm generally suspicious of them, to be honest, because many of these experiences involve aspects that actually defy biblical truth. So you, you'll have people say, I had visions of demons and Satan were torturing people in hell and scratching them or whatever, you know, Satan was in charge of hell and ruling and reigning the place. But, but this is unbiblical. Hell actually punishes fallen angels as much as it does man. There's no evidence that Satan is in charge of hell. And one day, actually, he will be punished in hell himself. So it's also it's the presence of the Lord that causes such torment. So, you know, this idea that demons and Satan are just running hell and God's just letting them, you know, torture all these people, that, that's just not a biblical concept. That That's not how hell works at all. Um, some of these experiences are often light versus darkness themed and they do enlighten the individuals sorry there's an ambulance going by uh, those experiences do often enlighten those individuals on principles of good versus evil but they're not necessarily biblically themed um, they may only point to god in a very generic sense rather than the God of the Bible specifically. And, uh, I remember watching a guy who um, said he became a deist because he'd uh, studied these out-of-body experiences. But a lot of these visions weren't really biblically themed. They were just, oh, you know, we know that there's good and we know that there's evil and there's some kind of a choice. And so, you know, he believed God in a very deist sense of the word. Um, Kat Kerr also, you, you've probably heard of this person. She's very well known um in christian christendom for sharing all of her visions of hell in quite vivid detail but aside from these visions she, she said some very eccentric and frankly utterly ridiculous things and and has been proven to falsely prophesy on multiple occasions um if you follow some of the ludicrous stuff that she said now she's been proven wrong prophesying about trump winning the election uh, again is perhaps one of the things that springs to mind and you know banging the stick and all of that commotion 
Um, but when we read the Bible, you know, in that Second Corinthians passage, Paul said it was not even lawful to utter his these visions of heaven. So, you know, Kat Kerr's visions are not really to be trusted. So, generally, you know, I'm very uh, suspicious of these out of body out of body experiences. They're very interesting, but don't let those things tell you what is right and wrong about about the Bible. Be very careful with those if if you're going to use those to justify what you believe from the Bible. Okay. Now, regarding the soul sleep doctrine, uh, so, you know, what the Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth believe, that when you die, you're unconscious until the resurrection. What what you have to do is you have to dismiss Luke 16 as only being a parable or only symbolic, rather than a more literal view. But this does present its own set of problems. So, it, first of all, it's the only parable where a person is actually named, because it's a certain man named Lazarus. Well, normally parables are just a certain man with no name given okay um you then have to answer the question of what the parable in luke 16 actually even represents because it's very dramatic and it's very unnecessarily sensational and hyperbolic if it only represents unconsciousness so what does it even represent um and really luke 16 is not the only part of the bible that suggests a consciousness in heaven prior to the resurrection um there are passages in revelation although these are you know arguably symbolic but but where believers have a conscious presence before the resurrection around the throne of god um i'm not going to cover those here but but you know you, you can see those out there when it deals with the 144,000 and the great multitude um, and also as well going back to what we have studied in john 11 um jesus said he who believes in me shall never die okay so we, we obviously can't apply that to our flesh because the flesh is dying anyway unless you know believers are all supposed to be raptured and nobody's ever supposed to die in the flesh i'm sure there's some kook out there who believes that somewhere but we, we can only really apply it to our soul so the the problem with the soul sleep doctrine arguably is that you're having to imply then that a person must be dead until the resurrection but that that would defy what jesus actually said in this chapter now th there's more that could be said on on this topic but it, it would digress from uh, john 11 it, it can only really be covered when we get to appropriate passages so that's that's all i'm really going to say on that here so i know i know that this has been a very short study uh, that kind of concludes john 11 um, it's just one of those chapters where things take a bit of a different turn and there's not as much salvation doctrine that we need to pluck out of here uh, people don't usually use this passage to teach any weird ideas that I'm aware of, at least not in the topic of eternal life. So that's all that I'm really going to say on John 11. Um, look out for a study on uh, John 12 soon, and there'll, there'll be a bit more that we can uh, pluck from that chapter.